Hello and welcome to History of Mathematics. My name is Tom McNamara and I'll be the instructor for this course. This is the first in a series of videos that I will be recording for our session. We will be following this textbook, Makers of Mathematics by Stuart Hollingdale. It is available on Amazon.com. You can also get it on your Kindle. The version that Amazon is offering right now has a slightly different cover, but don't worry about that. It's the same book on the inside. We'll be using that book as our guide through the course. We'll be reading it to learn about the historical context of the mathematics that we'll cover. Unfortunately, the book does not have any exercises, so I will be supplying those. They'll be available in the various modules of our Canvas course. The first chapter in Makers of Mathematics is called Beginnings, and it discusses the mathematics of ancient Egypt and Mesopotamia. So here on the document camera, I've got some notes for us. I'll be making these available through Canvas as well. So what we know about Egyptian mathematics comes from two main sources the so-called Rind or Alms Papyrus. Rind is the British archaeologist who found the papyrus, and Alms is the scribe who copied down this work from an earlier version. This is a collection of 84 example problems that cover things like arithmetic with whole numbers and fractions, solutions to linear equations, and also some geometric problems that involve finding area and volumes. As we'll see in just a few minutes, the process of Egyptian multiplication is a rather clever little procedure, and it involves adding and doubling. The other main source for our knowledge of Egyptian mathematics is the Moscow Papyrus. That's a collection of 25 problems, and one of those involves finding the volume of a truncated pyramid. So let's get into things with Egyptian multiplication. So we'll start out with an example. And the procedure will be the same no matter what numbers you use. Let me uh, jump into things with a couple of two-digit numbers. Let me go ahead and try, oh, let's do 13 times, oh, 56. Okay, so uh, the way we would start out, is I like to put the second factor over here in the second column. So we're going to be making a little table here with two columns. Okay, so the first row in our table is always going to have a 1 over here, and this will be one of the factors that we're multiplying. And then the entries in the next row will be double the entries in the previous row. So we double the 1 and get 2. We double the 56, and let me think, I guess that's 112. So the next row we double again. So the 2 gets doubled, it becomes a 4. 112 gets doubled, 224. Double again, 8 and 4, 48. Okay, now at this point we can stop because... The entries in the left-hand column would exceed this factor of 13. So let me just make a little note of that. We're going to stop here because this would exceed 13. Okay, naturally there's nothing special about 13. That's just that's what our left-hand factor was. Okay. Now, what 
we need to do is we need to find entries in the left-hand column that add up to 13. So no matter what this factor is, we'll always be able to find entries in this column that add up to our factor. Okay, so not too difficult here. We do 8 plus 4, that gets 12, and then we need 1 to get 13. So 8 plus 4 plus 1 gives us 13. And what we do is we add the corresponding entries right hand column to get product. Okay, so what we would do is we would take 56 plus 224 plus 448. Okay, so let's right quickly add those up. 448 plus 224. Do this in two steps. So if I add these two, I get 672 Okay, so it looks like I'm getting 728 as the product. Okay, so 13 times 56 is 728 using the Egyptian method of multiplication. Now naturally the Egyptians would not use our modern symbols to do this. They had their own symbols for writing their numbers. They had different symbols for each power of 10, but it was not a positional system. So they had a symbol for ones, they had a symbol for tens, they had a different symbol for hundreds and so on down the line. They could certainly write very large numbers in that system, but some of them would require a significant number of different symbols. Okay. So this little table method is what the Egyptians would have done to compute products. So we're doubling and we're adding. And we look for entries in the left-hand column that add up to this left-hand factor. And the right-hand column is double each time. We start with the right-hand factor and double each time. Now, of course, since multiplication is commutative, you could have swapped these. So in other words, you could have put a 13 here and a 1 here and then kept on doubling until you got to 56, as close as possible to 56, without going over. So that is the Egyptian process for multiplication.